So I've been talking about molecular orbitals in reactions, and in this part two, we're going to continue on looking at the lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals. We're going to focus on them, um, but just remind you that all reactions that uh, occur in, uh, are generally between these uh, homo and alumo uh, interaction. We've got this uh, highest occupied molecular orbital, which we often refer to as a nucleophile in organic chemistry, reacting with the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, which is effectively the electrophilic. The, the electrophile has this part, and uh, we've, we've referred to it as the electrophile. So those are the two key orbitals as they interact. Uh, to remind you that the highest occupied molecular orbitals are almost always lone pairs or lone pair electrons, uh, but the other two important examples are um, one is the uh, pi bond and the other one is the uh, a sigma high energy sigma bond all right so we'll see examples of that um, lumos are actually is a lot easier there's just two that we're going to be looking at in a little bit of detail uh, the one is just a uh, the sigma star antibonding uh, orbital and uh, this is typified by a substitution reaction. So a leaving group like bromine or chlorine or iodine uh, is a good example of this. We're going to use an antibonding orbital. And the other very important one is the pi star antibonding orbital. Uh, and this is very, very typical for uh, reactions involving the additions to carbonyls, uh, and, and which is quite a big section in organic chemistry. So we need to have an understanding of that. So let's have a look at these. We'll start with the uh, sigma star antibonding orbital. Okay, so we're looking now firstly at the sigma star antibonding orbital, and as I mentioned, a, a typical example of this is a substitution reaction. So I've got a, a rather dull substitution type reaction over here. It's just bromine, Br minus, acting as a nucleophile and substituting the chlorine on methyl chloride to give bromomethane and then the Cl minus anion. So in the formalism of organic chemistry, we use curly arrows. So this uh, negative charge is the lone pair of electrons, so that adds to the carbon. This is an SN2 reaction, so as that happens, this carbon-chlorine bond breaks like that, and we get our reaction product. There's a new sigma bond, and that's happened. But what is actually happening from a molecular orbital approach, that's what we need to look at now. Now, the thing is that uh, the reaction is happening on the LUMO of this, and we're breaking a sigma bond, so it's actually happening at the sigma star antibonding orbital. But in order to do that, we need to know how do we draw out the sigma star antibonding orbital of on this molecule over here. Now, actually, it's, it's very complicated. Um, I wouldn't expect you to be able to know on any particular molecule what it looks like exactly. However, it is possible for us to just draw out an approximation of the sigma star antibonding orbital and this reaction as a whole, and use the, and, and, and that'll be fine um, uh, to, to show what is actually happening in this, uh, in this reaction. So to do that, I actually remind you, to simplify it, we can actually just use an example um, that I've already shown you, and that is the bond between hydrogen, this, uh, the most simplest of our molecular orbitals. When we, when we drew that out, I showed you that um, we get, there's the sigma and the sigma star, orbitals of hydrogen look like this. So the one is the two, the two hydrogen atoms like that, and the bond is somewhere, this molecular orbital, which represents the sigma bond, is somewhere between the two hydrogen atoms. And in fact, we can put the two electrons, and they're in low in energy, because that's the bond. Uh, but then the antibonding orbital looks something like this. It's got sort of two lobes over there, and the one is shaded in. Note that this is one orbital. This is one, it's easy to see as one orbital, but this over here is one orbital as well, all right? Even though there's a space in between, this is not two orbitals, it's just one, and it's the antibonding sigma orbital. And this is what it looks like. If you put electrons in there, there's no bond between the two hydrogens, so they split, they go away. All right, so we can use this approximation to approximate the uh, sigma bond between carbon and chlorine, or even later on, we can use carbon between carbon and bromine. Any, any uh, uh, sigma bond that we want to use, we can use, we can actually approximate it the same way uh, as this over here. So, <clears throat> what does this look like if we want to show the molecular orbitals interacting over here? So we'll start first of all. Let's just 
start with the bromine. Uh, it's got a negative charge, which is actually just the lone pair of electrons. There are four lone pairs of electrons. What does the homo of that look like? Well, it's just some orbital that looks something like that. It's actually fine to just draw it like that with the two electrons uh, in it. Uh, that is the highest occupied molecular orbital of bromine. Now, this again is just an approximation. We don't know exactly what it looks like, but this is okay. Just to, it's something to do with the lone pairs, and it's gonna, and this is absolutely fine. Uh, this is going to interact with the carbon of, and there's the sigma bond, but we're not drawing out the sigma uh, molecular orbital because it's not involved in this reaction. Um, what we want to draw out is the antibonding orbital, which sits on the end like this. And we can shade that in, all right, because there's a phase change over there. This is one orbital. It looks exactly like this one over here. Um, and so this is the LUMO of the, uh, also the sigma star. Of the sigma bond. This is the sigma star antibonding orbital. We haven't drawn the hydrogens in, so we can just put those in as well, just to be complete. But this is what's happening. This highest occupied molecular orbital, um, which is on bromine, it's relatively uh, high in energy, um, it's the highest occupied molecular orbital, is going to interact with the luma, the sigma star of this, and so we can kind of show the arrow as it interacts over there with that orbital over there. It's going to form a new bond. When that happens, this bond is going to break, because as we put electrons into there, this is going to have to break. So one question you might ask yourself is, why is this, the HOMO, right, the highest occupied molecular orbital, reacting with the LUMA, but reacting with this lobe and not that lobe? I told you this is one orbital, so if it can react with this orbital, why can't it react with that orbital? Uh, so the simple answer is it actually could, in theory, react with that, but in practice it, it's not possible. And the reason for that is, one of the reasons, is electrostatic repulsion. So the chlorine is got a high electron density around it. It's more, more electronegative. Because of that, there's a negative charge over the chlorine. And bromine, being a nucleophile, also has a negative charge over it. And so those two negative charges do not want to interact with each other. So if the bromine had to approach over there, it wouldn't get very far. It would start getting close, and then the two negative charges would repel each other. Boom, they would disappear. Whereas this carbon has a slightly positive charge on it because of the polarization of this bond. It's more electronegative, the chlorine. Slightly positive charge. So actually, this is being attracted towards it and allows for a really favorable overlap between these two, this lobe of the antibonding orbital and this lobe of the uh, uh, highest occupied molecular orbital. So uh, I have pictures which we can have a look at. It's a model. I didn't make these models. This is from ChemTube3D, which you can go and have a look at. It's also linked in your textbook. All right, so when we look at this, we can see that uh, the bromine is this red atom, and then we've got the methyl chloride on the, on the right-hand side. And um, <clears throat> we can see that the, our, our approximation of the highest occupied molecular orbital is slightly wrong. It actually looks a little bit like a p orbital, uh, and it's uh, on its side over there. In fact, it is a p orbital, and uh, it's uh, those are the green uh, ones. And you can see the interaction is then with the sigma star of the methyl chloride, but notice we got that quite wrong. Um, the real sigma star is actually has these three lobes, the two purple and the one blue lobe. And, uh, but ultimately what, what we drew out over here is still a good enough approximation. And notice how the orbitals are overlapping with each other. And when that happens, it's actually an inversion of stereochemistry. That's also important. All right, so now we need to have a look at the pi star antibonding orbital. So the second uh, very important uh, LUMO to be looking at is the pi star antibonding orbital. This one is implicated uh, and, and is really incredibly important in carbonyl chemistry. Um, and the reason being is the carbonyl chemistry comes in with so many different flavors. I've just got formaldehyde here, which is simple, but aldehydes, ketones, esters, amides, um, carboxylic acids, all of these are C double bond O uh, containing functional groups. And so the reactions with uh, this uh, fun this moiety, this C double bond O, 
uh, is extensive in organic chemistry. So this is just a simple, that's well, the first step of a cyanohydrin formation, one variant of it. Um, and from a mechanistic point of view, we recognize there's the nucleophile, negative charge in the carbon. It comes in, breaks this pi bond, um, and the electrons end up on the oxygen. So we formed a new sigma bond uh, with those electrons. And we've uh, rationalized this before by saying that the nucleophile is attracted to the carbon, which is slightly positively charged, because the oxygen is more electronegative. Pi bonds are weak, and so this is able to add in this fashion. We break that, we form this new sigma bond. and get the other. So this, mo this motif is very, very popular. We can obviously do the reverse reaction in this as well, which is also... Um, a valid mechanism going back to to the, the carbon ion. We should be able to do that. But what is actually happening? How do we describe this looking at the molecular orbitals? Um, so again, uh, reactions are homo-lumo interactions. So this is the nucleophile. It's a lone pair of electrons and a negative charge here. That must be the highest occupied molecular orbital the new, uh, yeah, uh, that's taking part in this reaction. And this over here must be the LUMO, and the LUMO must be in the, the, uh, the, the pi antibonding orbital. So let's just remind ourselves quickly what these things look like. So we've got to have a bit of a, a sense uh, of this. So if we look at the formal group from the side, uh, something that looks a bit like this is an H and an H. So what does the pi bond look like? Well, the pi bond is these two p orbitals that have merged together, and we've seen that before in some other videos. They kind of look like these jelly bean sort of uh, orbitals, uh, and that's one molecular orbital. Uh, they're two different phases. That's the why uh, the one is actually uh, colored in over there, and the one is empty. Uh, and this is what, if we were to draw that out, this is the pi bond molecular orbital, and it looks something like that. Remember, this is just one orbital. If there's two electrons, they're either there or there, but they're not in the middle, but it's just one orbital. What does the antibonding orbital look like? Well, the antibonding orbital um, looks like what we've done uh, before uh, when we looked at just the, the, the orbitals of ethylene. The antibonding orbital is something that looks a bit like this. Now, this is a little bit more, more difficult to draw out. Um, and it almost looks like two p orbitals, but they're not overlapping with each other. So because it's an antibonding orbital, those two are not, there's a node between them. There's a node between them, and there's a node this way um, between those as well. So there's like four lobes, but this is just one orbital. It's the pi star antibonding orbital. So all of our antibonding, the LUMO, and actually for all reactions, it's the LUMO. This is a classic uh, uh, acceptor for nucleophiles, and it is a LUMO in many, many reactions. Whenever we do reactions on a carbonyl group, is the LUMO. By the way, this is not the highest occupied molecular orbital load. In fact, this is um, two levels down from the highest occupied molecular orbital. The highest occupied molecular orbital must be, if you remember and, uh, what we've spoken about before, it has to be the lone pair electrons. There's two lone pairs, so there are two molecular orbitals which uh, correspond to effectively the lone pairs. They're higher in energy. I'm not drawing them, them out <laughs> too complicated. But it's not important to worry about that because that's not involved in this reaction. What's involved in this reaction is the HOMO of the nitrile is adding to the LUMO of the, uh, the, the carbonyl, which is the pi antibonding orbital, and this is what it looks like over here. So we can draw in the nitrile, all right, and we can draw in its HOMO with the lone pair of electrons. I've done it like that. We are just simplifying it like this, just by uh, drawing in one uh, orbital over there. That's not exactly what it looks like. In fact, it's got another lobe there, but I'm not, I'm not going to worry about that. Um, this is okay. This is the HOMO of the nitrile now interacting with this lobe uh, over here of the, the LUMO of the pi star antibonding. Uh, and that's how the reaction occurs. Now, it can either act with this lobe or this lobe over here. Why it doesn't add to either of these two lobes is exactly the same argument that we had before. Oxygen is more electronegative. There's a greater negative charge over this oxygen. 
your nuclear file is negatively charged as well, so it's not drawn to the side. If it comes close to these lobes over there, it's going to be repelled by electrostatic interactions, so it won't interact with those, whereas it will interact with those lobes over there. There is one extra level of information which is important because it affects all of these reactions, and there's so many of them, Grignard reactions, nitrile, acetal formation, um, you know, other carbon-carbon bond forming reactions, all happening. Uh, at, uh, at, uh, at into the pi psi antibonding orbital of carbonyl, um, it's the angle of attack. The way I've drawn it here doesn't really cover. I'm going to show you some pictures just now. But um, this kind of the way I've done these lobes, it kind of makes it look like if we overlap nicely, that the that the nuclear file comes at 90 degrees to this carbonyl. It sort of looks like it's coming would come like that. But the reality is these lobes don't point like that. They're actually angled slightly away. That's why I drew this coming in at a bit of a funny angle. And the, that angle is actually very well known and defined. It's 107.5 degrees. Uh, it, and that angle is known as the Berge Dunnitz angle of attack. Uh, it's well known and in third year courses is very important for understanding some of the, 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 the models. So for now it's good just to know this, uh, certainly in my second year course I don't expect you to know this, uh, but if you do write it down sometimes it affects bonus marks. Anyway, so what do what do these orbitals actually look like? So yeah, I've drawn uh, these molecular mod uh, models, yeah we can see the formal group. Um, uh, looking from the top. Uh, if we look at the pi bond, remember this is not the homo, it's just the pi bond. If we look at that, um, we turn it around to the side <coughs> and we look at it over there. Um, just one thing that I want to point out, notice that the pi bond is not symmetrical, that it's actually slightly bigger uh, on the oxygen side of the, of, the, of the pi bond. And that's because oxygen is more electronegative, so the, the bond actually sits like that. And it's actually also noticeable um, when we look at the antibonding, there's a, there's a reverse that happens. So here's the antibonding, and we can see the four lobes, but notice that now the lobes that are closest to the carbon are actually um, are slightly larger. And, and that is also a consequence of the electronegativities of the two, of the two atoms. Remember the antibonding orbital is an empty orbital. Um, and so if you think about it, it kind of makes sense that it would be sort of distorted slightly bigger on the carbon atom. Okay, so those are the, the two uh, important LUMO uh, orbitals that we you know. Th this one looks the same. That what we've drawn here, what we approximate, is actually what it really looks like. So this is a good one to, to draw as is. We just need to remember that in the sigma antibonding orbital, that we're making an approximation. It's not really probably what it won't look like in reality when you draw it out, but it's actually okay. It's an approximation that actually works out um, fine and in, in terms of the, the real molecular orbital. All right.